wife Mary back in 1950. Jim liked to build things like our dry dock, which is made of leftover Trans-Alaska pipeline. That's what's keeping it afloat. 1,200 feet of it. The same kind of pipe that carries oil from the top of the state to the bottom of wheeling. Those see the rails and tracks in the river like a few pieces of part. Five big runners in the back for steering. Bow and stern thrusters on this more modern vessel that almost make it turn like this more quickly. They're not essential to the machine. And even though the boat weighs 280 tons, we only need 39 inches of water. That's why my life jacket drill doesn't take very long. I don't even know why we have a lot of cops in there. Oh no, we're sinking! or out the window, so keep each other honest on that. Steve is on his way. 1951 Piper Super Cub on floats right over there. Already up and off the river. There we go. See, corkscrew it right down, but then leave enough space to hang out over the surface of the river, and then he feels his way down because he can't see the water at this point. So this is all done using a lot of experience and puts both floats in at the same time. And that's how it's done. Our friend Steve Kadatzer in 2-4 Alpha over there. Now this is because for the first nine to ten days of their life, their eyes aren't open yet. So they're really dependent on a sense of smell and on a sense of touch to get used to us. And then you can see by the time they're this age, they really already know and trust us. They're running around with confidence. And that is all because we are working to create a trust and be trusted relationship, which was honestly the key to all my mom's success out there. Once they do get um, a little more comfortable on their legs, we like to bring them out to this little enclosure here and encourage them to, say, jump over the logs. That's the challenge today. Now, at first, for a couple of them, like this little black one, um, it's a little challenging. But once we're going to be there to help them if they can't quite do it. And then once they're able to do it on their own, we praise them on the other side. And this teaches the puppies that we're never going to ask them to go any farther or faster than they're capable of. So we want to have dogs running out there that we really know and trust. We start looking for the characteristics of a lead dog when they're as young as pups sometimes because you can see a smart puppy who's the first to jump over the log. Now this is a pretty powerful team, just nine dogs in a race like the Iditarod at the Quest. you got 14, so you can imagine how much dog power. I'm using a four-wheel brake device today. Uh, we've taken out the engine and enhanced the brakes on this guy. Uh, and you'll see in a second why we don't need any sort of extra gas support. Yeah, I was going to say, it's just tragic these dogs aren't eager to do this. <laughs> Look at all that. You, you watch how quiet it's going to get here. As soon as she pulls the trigger, everybody leans in, starts to pick up speed, and Tekla is gone. But keep looking to the left now. It's so impressive that they can carry me and the four-wheeler. Together, we weigh about 400 pounds and still be going at 20 miles per hour. Beautiful. So that at the end of a race, they can pass competitors in front of us and keep those other competitors behind us. This team looks great. They're excited to get back. Here comes the team. I hope the brakes are working so we don't end up in the reverse. Okay, Tekla, another great run. Nicely done. little sibling rivalry in the back there, it happens. More importantly though, after gym class we get to go to the pool, which is uh, very refreshing. Now Tekla, I mentioned how you and some of the crew are going to bring dogs that our guests can meet. 